Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Volpe Creates Show, the weekly talk show about video games, game development, and the games industry. I am your host, Chris Volpe, joined, as always, by a baby girl. I'll put her over there. And uh, intern Lucas, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing good. It's been a busy week, but we're making it through. Uh, it's been lovely, weather-wise, so that's nice. I think after this, I'm going to go do a run. Uh, and then uh, we're going to go do poker night, right? Multivarious poker night. Yeah. Well, I am super excited for our special guest. Not that I'm always not super excited for our special guests, but uh, this week we have uh, my friend Grant Kirkhope, who has been in the industry, not to, not to age you, but you've been in the industry quite a long time. And uh, you've been a part of GDEX before uh, several times. And so, Grant, I'm super excited to have you and chat with you today. Glad you are. <laughs> uh, so before we start, I always like to just give the guests a, a quick opportunity to kind of say who you are and just tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Uh, I'm a composer, uh, primarily for video games, although I, although I have done some movies uh, in the last few years, so I'm trying to do a bit more of that. So I was at Rare, started in 1995, did Banjo Kazooie, GoldenEye, Banjo Tooie, Donkey Kong 64, Perfect Dark, did Vinyata and Grabber the Ghoulies, uh, the, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then I quit in 2008, shifted across to America and did Kingdoms and Amalore Reckoning and then Civilization. Mickey Mouse, Castle of Illusion, I did a bit of that. Uh, what else have I done recently? I've done World of Warcraft Shadowlands, uh, Minecraft Dungeons, and, and most recently, I guess I've done Mario Rabbids Kingdom Battle, and I'm doing Mario Rabbids Sparks of Hope at the moment. So that's kind of where I And I've done a couple of movies, The King's Daughters, I guess the most notable, but I've just been out in the last few weeks. Uh, yeah. starring, it had a proper theatre release, so I got to go and see a movie that I, I wrote the music for in a theatre, Pierce Brosnan and K.S. Godelario, so it's quite special to do that. Yeah, so, that's uh, awesome. Yeah, so that's kind of where I am at the moment. I imagine that was pretty exciting. You so said you got to do like a theater release, uh, like a premiere? Well, I got to do the full, you know, I, there was no premiere for it. Um, but um, but um, we, uh, it was nice. When I moved to LA, I said to my wife, would, you know, my plan was to get a movie in a movie theater and go and see it. That was kind of my, my goal. Mm -hmm. It's taking it take a little bit of time. <laughs> but I kind of got, got there. You again. got there? Yeah, so no, it's super cool to, to be on like a major release. It's like, you know, it's... um. It's very special, you know. Very oh, lucky. totally, totally. And I think you didn't you win a, a award a couple of years ago for one of your uh, films, I think. Oh yeah, I got the Silicon Beach score for. There's a movie called Shadows, which actually it's, it got slightly delayed because the distributor messed it right up, um, but it's coming out in May. So Shadows, yeah, I won the score at the Silicon Beach Film Festival, I think, for that one. It doesn't sound like me. You'd be surprised. It's quite dark, synthy, um, but. Um, but I did that. This is to the same director, a guy called Michael Matteo Rossi, who I met over here. And I did um, the handler for him just before Christmas and the shadows I did a couple of years ago. Well, maybe a year and a bit ago, but it delayed. So it's coming out in, in May. And I'm, and I'm doing the next one of his cover sweepers, which is just getting put together now. That's that's awesome, man. You've been you've been busy. I uh, what got me. Uh, well, I'm always thinking of you, Grant. But what oh. got me te texting you for the show was I went to um, this like arcade here in columbus for a birthday party and they had a mario rabbits uh arcade machine and i right. was like oh i should see what, what grant's up to because i know you did the uh the first one which i got halfway through playing i need to go back and beat it but um you're also working on the uh the upcoming one correct right yeah i was quite i was very happy to be asked to come back it's always a good sign that they like you if they ask to come back so uh, and I, you know i've got a great relationship with david soliani and roman brio who's the audio director and david is the creative director at uh, some lab um, they're like, we're friends, and we're friends now, really. I mean, we've been working together since 2015 or something. So, I mean, I guess at some point they'll fire me. I mean, developers usually fire composers eventually and get them because they want to change. But I feel like even when they do, we'll still be friends because we've been sort of, we're pretty, we're very close over these umpteen years we've been working together. So, um, um, no, I mean, you know, and also, you know, to get to write for Mario is pretty bloody amazing. I mean, you know, if you told me that in 1995 when I started at Rare, I never would have believed it, you know, so. Oh, yeah, been, totally. It's been mega special to get to do that. So I've been, I feel like I've been very honored to get us to do that. Yeah, I, that's amazing. And I think um, Mario Rabbids was one of those games that kind of, uh, I don't want to say like people weren't expecting big things from because that's not, but it kind of came out and people were like, wow, this game's awesome. And the fact that it's been so well received and that they're doing a, a sequel to it. Uh, 
it's got to be exciting. Yeah, no, I think that, yeah, no, I think um, when it first got it got leaked quite a lot, right? Just before just before it got announced at E3, and everybody was like, "This is a ridiculous idea." Mario and the Rabbits, it's going to be terrible, you know. And it doesn't mm-hmm. sound like a great idea, you know, until you actually get to play it and see it. And when Davide first presented it to me, it was like, it was a, it just seemed like super funny and it was a great match because the, the rabbits are super crazy, like very sort of minions esque, you know. Um, yeah. And they kind of don't understand the mushroom kingdom and all the rest of it, and they did break stuff like you know a lot, you know. But like when you when you get it pitched, it doesn't sound like a great idea until you see it. So it was quite disheartening for the team because you know prior to the E3 unveiling, a lot of stuff got leaked. Um, got a bit of slagging in the press. People were like, "This is a ridiculous idea. It's going to be terrible." But when we, when we when we got got shown at E3 that year at the Orpheum Theatre here in LA, um, like it was such a relief because everyone went so mad when they saw it. They went, "Oh, this is brilliant!" You know, um, and I, it was such a relief for all the team, we, all of us together. We kind of felt really sort of validated that it was, a, and especially for Davide because Davide came up with the idea in the first place, right? He had to pitch it to Mr Miyamoto in person in San Francisco. I mean, think about that, the pressure on somebody to sit down with a game you put together using his, using his biggest character, Sure. you know, to, to Mr. Miyamoto in person, right? not, not a Zoom call, in, sat in the room, you know. I like, he put it together in like three weeks in Unity. Like, it was super, super quick, the kind of main picture, the main idea. Oh. Um, and Mr. Miyamoto loved it, you know, and, like, and just, he couldn't, he actually said to Davide, how did you get hold of the, of the Nintendo animations? Because, you know, because we didn't give them to you. So now that we did it by ourselves, he couldn't believe that the team had, managed to duplicate all the kind of Mario movements exactly as Nintendo used them without the actual animations from Nintendo. Um, you know, so um, that was, so, you know. So the original special. pitch, like the original pitch was just like three weeks of like, can we make something flashy and make it look and feel Mario? Yeah. Knowing totally. that you're going to have to go talk to Miyamoto at yeah, the end of this so, process. So, I know, can you imagine that? Like, wouldn't you just completely shit yourself at that prospect? Like, you know, like, um, I don't know how they did it. Yeah, you know he's such a massive Miyamoto fan. He just Miyamoto's god to Davide, you know. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, when it came to that unveiling at the E3, and and um, Mr. Miyamoto said his name, and I said, "That's my hand." You see, going Davide, get up, get up, you know. <laughs> so, you know, he started to cry, you know, because um, you just couldn't believe that that the game he dreamed of all those years finally got to the point of being unveiled at the E3. Mr. Miyamoto loved it. It was getting on the stage, all that stuff, you know. And even I yeah. knew Mr. Miyamoto was there, but I still jumped out of my skin when he turned up. Like when he was on the, I knew he was on the stage, you know, like just crazy. So it's been a real amazing ride that has for me. That's yeah, that's exciting. That uh, reminds me of uh, last week we had, or two weeks ago we had one of our friends, uh, Scott, who worked at PlayStation, and he talked about when he met Hideo Kojima uh, for the first time, and he was just like starstruck talking to Hideo Kojima. And I was like, I I can imagine. I've never met either of them, but I had imagined I would be starstruck as well. Um, and I don't even have a game that he needs to approve. I just, you know, I just meet him. No, I mean, uh, I think that it's always hard meeting your heroes, I think. Because you don't know what to say. You just kind of want to go, I think you're great. You know, you, don't, you know, it's, yeah. it's, hard, it's hard, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when I, mean, I grew up with, uh, my first console was the ColecoVision. Uh, but then I had Nintendo, Super Nintendo. So, like, I grew up with all of those. I played plenty of the games that you worked right. on, you know, when I was in, in high school. And so, you know, meeting, you know, things, I mean, hell, even, uh, I can't remember, was it, I think it was Sean Beeson that connected us, you and I, I think yeah, so. Yeah, I know Sean, yeah, I think it was, yeah. Yeah, and like, um, I remember the first time I was chatting with you, and like, I was a little starstruck, because I was just like, I remember the songs you worked on are like ingrained in my brain, you know, like, I've, I've got, I've got, I could, I, I probably whistle at least one of your songs, you know, once a week, just fiddling around the house, cleaning or something, you know? Right. Well, I'm, glad, I'm glad to hear it. No, I, I, always, <laughs> I always feel like you can make that what you want of it. I think, I think some people like the ego thing and all the rest of it and like being aloof. I don't like that. I hate that mm-hmm. ego thing. I, I want to just be that bloke that writes tunes now and then, you know, so I don't feel like I'm different to anybody else. I never felt different to anybody else. And I think that, um, and I like to be like that. I, don't, I just don't like the ego thing. I mean, living in LA, you meet plenty of people have got a lot of bravado about them, you know, um, and it's just not me. I'm too much of a, just a north. A north I'm, a, I'm from Scotland. I'm born in Scotland, right? But I spend a lot of my life in the north of England. I'm just a northerner. I don't. I just can't be putting up with that nonsense. It's not. It's not for me. Is that a? Uh, is that like a Scottish vibe culture thing? Yeah, is I that... think Scot- Scottish people don't take any nonsense from people. Really, it's very, very blunt. And you, and also, I lived in North Yorkshire, which is the biggest county in in England. 
and um, North Yorkshire is known for being very blunt and very brash, and they just speak the minds, and they don't. There's no, there's no, the, no bullshit. I mean, it just comes out the way it is. You have to like, it. and I think I feel like me being a combination of Scotland and North Yorkshire. It's kind of the worst combination of blunt brashness. I don't like any, <laughs> any I don't like any nonsense. I like to speak my mind. You know, if, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, and I'll, I'll say I'm wrong. But I, I, I just can't stand that kind of waffly nonsense that goes on with people i just want it to be direct get to the point let's get on with it you know yeah totally and i think in um creative endeavors this is like one of the things i talk with my students about like learning how to discuss things like critically and creatively without like you said beating around the bush because everybody's there to make the best thing they can and so you just want to kind of get to the point uh while still being you know considerate and you know you don't want to be an asshole but uh, uh, but it, it, that's definitely uh, a skill. And I would say, you know, I mean, I think it's great that that's not a thing because I think, I mean, you are definitely one of the top game composers in in the field right now, for sure. I mean, uh, you know, I've got to say, I don't feel like that. Like, I never yeah. felt like that. Like, in, in in England, I've got the, the football league, the soccer league. It's like Premier Division, first, second, third, and fourth divisions, I think. And mm-hmm. I've always felt like I'm a first division composer. I never felt like I made it into the Premier League ever. Um, so I just feel like I'm just, I know, I know, I, know, I just know I am. I, I've never felt like I'm that special. So I, I always think that I'm sort of first division at best, <laughs> you know, not, not Premier League, you know. Um, sure. But, but I do agree with you about the whole, the communication thing's mega important. And like, especially for, like for me, dealing with um, Ubisoft and Lamont, Ubisoft Paris for the Mario games, you know, those guys, English isn't their first language, you know. So, you know, sometimes, I mean, even though Davide and Ramaz, English is very good, sometimes it gets a bit lost. You know what yeah. we try to get across to me, and I've, sometimes I've said things that I've taken. They've said and the, the word means something different to to them than it means to me. You know, mm-hmm. so that makes it a little bit tricky sometimes. But I do feel like you're right. I think you have to get be direct, but not insulting. You know. Yeah. I think you know you just you just don't want to say that shit. You know, you've got to say, look, I think this is you know we could probably do better than that. I mean, because I, I mean to, to be fair, I get that every day. Like, you know, I don't think I've written any tune for. For the Mario game that didn't have more than one or two revisions, like I don't think I've sure. ever just written a tune. They've gone, yeah, great, never, you know. And I think you have to get used to taking that because I think it's, you know, I guess when when I meet young composers like you, you, you're talking to your students, you know, sometimes they're a bit like, I'm the composer, I know what's going on. These video game guys don't know what they're talking about, and you can't be like that, you know. It's not going to work that way. You just got to get fired, aren't you? Yeah, and and gaming is such a um, we were having this conversation last week, but like, it's not like making a movie right where everything is like in framed the pacing is dictated all that's in a game like you never know what the your players are going to be looking at the the music needs to be able to be like flexible enough to handle different situations and come in and out of you know maybe an action set piece or or whatever um so that's like just a lot of a lot of twists and turns i'm sure you got to work on and then uh you i think I think you have a tendency to use a lot of instrumentation in your music. Uh, and I know you also pull out some interesting instruments. So I'm sure that that there's some complexity around that when you're, when you're navigating that, like for, I mean, we can talk about Mario Rabbids, or we can talk about anything, but for like most of your projects, I, I'm, there's a vibe that the game is kind of getting across to you, but do you have like kind of freedom of how you choose to express that vibe, which instruments you use, all that stuff or I think a little bit. I think I think instrumentation wise, yes. I think vibe wise, not always. Because you know, it's like you know, it's like. I mean, you make games. If, if people say to you, you know, say to me a particular level or a specific scenario, I've got I've got to imagine what it's going to sound like. So I'll have mm-hmm. a I'll have a go my first go. I might get it wrong the first time or the wrong vibe or something. Often, like people will send me a link to an MP3 or a movie scene or something that they think's in the right direction, so it points in the right direction. So you get the, they get the gist of it at the start, you know, so that's all right. So I need, yeah. you know, I always, I do, funny enough, I do like strong direction. I like to get people to be very sure about what they want. So they're going to say, I want it to be like the Matrix or Harry Potter or whatever, this scene in the Matrix or this scene in Harry Potter or this part of John Williams or this bit of Al Silvestri or the, the Avengers or whatever it is, you know, so they can point you in the right direction, you know. Um, so, but so even but even then, I think sometimes people, you know, because people don't know musical language. Mo- most people don't know it, so it's hard for them to put into words what they want sometimes. And even the things they think they want, maybe they don't want it when they hear it. You know. Yeah. So it's a very to and fro. 
But I, I got to say, I, I like the to and fro of it all. Like, sometimes it can get a bit laborious if you get up, up to like 25 versions, right? It gets a bit like, you know, this is a lot of music I've written and you haven't liked any of it so far. And that only happens very rarely. Um, but it has happened. Um, so, but I feel like when you get that complete collaboration and you trust people, I think you get the best results in the end. That thing that I thought about in the start, that I thought was perfect. When when I've had talked to the developer and I've changed it to what they they put their input to, it's turned out better in the end. You know. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think the uh, you said trust. I think that's oh, sweet. I think trust is as a big part when you're working with a team and you, you you can trust that you can speak openly and honestly and figure out these things collaboratively. Um, you mentioned uh, John Williams a second ago. I, the other day I was just watching the uh, when he created the Harry Potter theme right that that they needed a they needed like a trailer cut like real fast and they were like can you make a theme and like they didn't have any material for him and so he just kind of had to navigate and he just ended up pulling out a couple weird instruments that he stumbled into that like you know mm. thing uh which of course is iconic now for for harry potter but um i think that would be a case where like blank sheet of paper we need something in a week go do you get do you get many of those or is the game industry like a little more i don't know it seems like some of these bigger games everything is so planned out i do get some of those you know from, from time to time you do you know they do get stuck and just think can you just write something quickly um i mean that harry potter example is fantastic because you just wrote it with no idea what what about you'd see nothing right i mean to pull that tune out of your ass like that and, yeah i mean i mean my god what what an absolutely iconic piece of music that is I mean, you know, I'm a mass. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't think there's any composer who's not a huge John Williams fan. He's just the best, isn't he? Um, sure. But I mean, um, yeah, I do get stuff like that. I mean, you know, sometimes I do trailers sometimes occasionally, not very often, but now and then where they just want something that's kind of, and you write something, they go, ah, yeah, so can you cut that? Cutting it so a bit, a big mess of cutting and trying to make it fit and all the rest of it, you know? Um, but I mean, um, I don't know. I just, I just think it, it, games are a collaborative process, right, most of the time. You get one guy at the top, right, the creative director, who has got, he's got the grand overall vision of the whole thing, the top-down thing, you know, but then you get left to your own devices, the animators and the programmers, and all, you know, but he guides it all along via his sort of management structure, you know, that's beneath him. You know, and sometimes, like, when I was at Rare, right, <laughs> you know, back in the day, there was like 15, 16 people on the team, and that was it, and you just got on with it, you know, and none of us really yeah. knew what we were doing. But like, when it came to GoldenEye, nobody had made a game before. Like no one had made it. We had no idea what we were doing. And so you just have that thing where you just stick it together. Oh, that looks all right. Oh, that sounds all right. And, it, you know, sometimes I think when you get this kind of producery sort of overseeing role of this, you know, it sometimes gets a bit, gets a bit diluted. And I feel sure. a lot of times these days, games get made by committee not, and not by a grand view. And I sometimes feel that gives you that kind of, more everybody likes it a bit but nobody loves it thing because everybody gets a little bit what they want but it's not that kind of absolute solid and get the best games i've worked and you've got a strong guy at the top goes this is how it's going to be you know do it the way i want it and you live or die you live and die by it if it's, if it's crap you fall on your sword it's, it's tough luck right yeah when it's yeah. good it's fantastic so you know the best people that i've worked with um certainly like greg males at, at rare who's a bit like that and also david salian is like that at ubisoft milan like absolute big overview of the whole thing, touch every part of the game, music to sound effects to animation to everything to concept art, you name it. Like, you know, that for me is when the best games get made. Um, I sometimes feel as games get more and more corporatized, if that's a word, um, sometimes you end up with something that's a bit wishy-washy, not, not very strong. Sure, yeah, I think, you know, if you're making a hundred million dollar game, hundred million dollar plus game, like you gotta make sure it sells, right? And so there's a lot of people that have their hands in it that might be concerned it's going one way or the other. Um, but no, I, I, I just kind of blows my mind. Yeah, when you think about, you know, you said a team of 16 people, like, you know, you think of something like id Software making Doom and it's like four people in a house, you know? Mm -hmm. There, there aren't a lot of games in the indie scene. There are um, still, but yeah, you just—it was just a different style of development. Um, I guess that's the way it was, right? I mean, I, and I, I guess you know, Rare was in was an indie company. It wasn't, it wasn't owned by well, Nintendo later on, but you know, at the start, it was just an indie company, right, with the two brothers running it. Um, and I must admit, 
And I feel like the indie scene is a very, really, a really vibrant games making space. I think there's lots of people making the wacky stuff, you know, that is brilliant and it's gonna it'll change the games industry in a while, you know. And I kind of yeah. like that. And like, you know, when, when I used to go to GDC, I used to always just go on the Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and not go to, the, not bother with the first two indie games, the first two days with the indie games conference. And Danny Banoski, who's you know, a great friend of mine, and Jimmy Hinson said, you should come to the indie park Monday, Tuesday. It's a, gr- it's a great thing to watch the indie guys talking about stuff. So I went to those, you know, every time I went, I went to the indie park too. And like, it's, it, the story was almost nearly identical. Some guy in his bedroom said, I'm just going to make a game. I'll probably do it in six months. He did it and it took him five years to get it out the door. Like usually it takes them way longer than they think because the games are hard, right? But there's some oh, really? fantastic inspirational things that people come out with in the indie sector. Like just like fresh and new or like retro looking, but with great mechanics or, you know, you know what I mean? That kind of thing where, you know, I love that part of it. It really reminds me of that when I first got to Rare, all the guys who were sat in the bedrooms working on Spectrums in, in Assembler, you know, back in the, the late 80s, or whatever, are the guys that ended up being the great programs at Rare in the 90s, you know, you know, and uh, it's that kind of that kind of mentality where the code wasn't perfect, but it was fast. And it was slick and it did things sure for, for a specific reason it wasn't like a great big huge utopian this is how you write code for university it wasn't like that it was like these guys who'd sat playing with the spectrums in their bedrooms for years and going i know how to make this work even though it's not it doesn't look great do this you know and i really like that attitude i think it's i feel the like indie guys are like that yeah oh absolutely um Ah, that's a good one. Let me think about that. Well, while, while you're thinking, I know that we have a comment here, uh, which I just lost it. So let me find it again. Uh, from Sugar Princess Fluff, where Banjo Kazooie music has been uh, their ringtone since they got their first phone. So, wow. Are... Oh, well, I'm very, I'm honored. I'm honored. I'm trying to work up from a game. There's quite a few things. I, mean, I guess, you know. There's probably quite a few non-PC things that got cut from games for, for reasons of the past. It rare for definite. Um, you know, I've sometimes written tunes that I think are really appropriate, but they've been kicked out because people don't like them. You know, that does happen quite a bit here and there. Um, like, I guess in My Rabbids, the, there's that, the big part with um, that, the, that opera boss that sings and gives Mario a roasting. There's, it's a, kind of one of the bosses there. He's called Phantom of the Boapra, I think he's called. But he's like, the, the, the original idea was to have a, an opera song, a rap song, and a metal song, and the, and the, and the opera guy would sing, would sing it in the style. And so I wrote these three, these three pieces. But in the end, it just got kicked out. It didn't really work. And we ran out, it seemed to, we ran out of time, so I couldn't do part three. So I had this metal version. It's, it's on, the, on the, if you buy the vinyl, the My Rabbids, the, the track is on there. Me sing, I had to sing the part right, because I had to write it and sing it, first of all. So Davides put it on, put it on the record didn't tell me um so it's a shame that some of those some of those got kicked out and there was really there was really some really funny bits in grabbed by the ghoulies that got kicked out just uh, so i guess they weren't particularly pc at the time so uh they got a little bit kicked out but there's some really super funny bits in the in grabbed by the ghoulies i mean i guess also there's probably some funny bits in all the games at rare because rare that kind of quirky that kind of quirky sense of humor you know Mm-hmm. Um, and so quite a lot of stuff. It's hard to sort of say without, without getting people in trouble. So uh, I better not say. But there's been definitely been a few bits that I've, I've missed. Yeah, we don't we don't have to throw anyone under the bus. Um, <laughs> uh, and yeah, I'll, I'll put the uh, the link to that album in the description for this video if people want to check it out. Uh, back to the the indie thing, just real fast. Do you get approached by smaller studios, indie devs who are ever looking to do uh, work with you? Yeah, I mean, usually indie guys will say to me, they can afford to pay me for one track. You know, they'll give me a little, you know, they want to do a theme song, and I'll do a theme song. I just did that, that game, Horror Vale, for, um, I've got the company now. I think they're called Horror Vale Games. But anyway, so but I just did a, a tune for them. Um, and I did um, uh, Inter- Interstellar Space Genesis. Did that a couple of years ago for Praxis Games in Portugal. Um, and wrote two, three tunes for them. <clears throat> um, I did desktop dungeons with Danny Vanoski for uh, for the guys from South Africa. Uh, QFC design, I forget that what they're called. Um, I've done a, what's that? The one about the cave? Not the haunted cave? Magical cave? No. Oh my god, I've got the name of it. That's gonna kill me. Uh, <laughs> it'll come back to me in a minute. I'm just I'm getting all the current. Anyway, no. So I, yeah, I'm I'm happy to do indie games. I really am. Um, Sometimes I feel like indie games hire me to put my name on it so they can sell it, I think. But I don't mind that, it's all right. If my name's selling a thing, they're welcome to it, you know. 
Yeah. Um, but um, so I, do, I, I sort of tend to charge a little bit less money if we're indie guys, but I can't do it for free, not really. Sure. Um, if I would, I could. Uh, if, if I could, I would. Um, but I feel like I can't really. Um, so I do, but I do charge a little bit less. So because I, I, I can't indie guys out brilliant because I think indie guys are the future. Yeah, we we do the same thing when we do um, like our dev work, where if we're working with like a, a big corporation, we have our rate, and then if it's a small startup or an indie studio. We'll try to cut it down uh, as much as we can to to help them out. Um, and who knows? I mean, we're always helping folks. So, but yeah, that's uh, that's awesome. I, I know that. Uh, I, I guess I had to phrase this about the I don't know, putting your name on something. I guess you know who knows <laughs> if it if it sells or not. But um, I know a lot of people like your name is a is a positive thing in the industry. So I guess take. Take it for whatever that's worth, you know. I don't mind. I just, you know, I can spot it a mile off when they when they're a bit doing that a little bit, you know. Um, like I say, I, you know, I'm a work for hire composer. You want to hire me? That's fine. That's what. Yeah. That's where. That's where I make a living. That's how I pay for my house and my kids and my wife and all the rest of it, you know. So, I I write music to make money, you know. So um, that's all I live. Um, you know, I've, 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 I haven't really written anything purely for fun. In twenty odd years, I, when I was started writing in '95, right? So. Since then, I don't think I've done anything for fun. Since then, apart from two trombone concertos, I've done two trombone concertos, um, and they were one for a, a bass, a tenor trombone, one for a bass trombone. Um, but that's something I've ever done. I think since I've started in games, that's not for games. Wow, does that does that bother you at all, or is just you're happy doing what you're doing? No, I, I like you know, I don't, you know, the thing about me is I, I like to write music, right? That's all I can do. I have really have no other talent whatsoever. My wife's a term pissed at me for being completely useless like you know i can't put up a shelf or do anything remotely diy to the house i just i just i break things i'm just i'm very clumsy so i think um i think i'm inherently clumsy because i speak quickly right? when i was in the uk i said the long, a bit long story but when i was in the uk I, I, can't, I was trying to work out why do i speak so fast it's pissing me off like everybody can't tell what i'm saying so i went to see a speech therapist in the uk and she said what you've got is called clutter speech which is not like a stutter it's like a thing where the, way, the best way I describe it is it's like all the words are running for the door at once and they kind of mm -hmm. get stuck and I can't, I can't rearrange it in my head quick enough because I'm, I'm thinking so quickly. But she says, one thing about people who've got clutch speech, they're very clumsy. Because, and, she said, and I just am really clumsy. And like you forget, because you do things so quickly, you forget you've done them. Like turning a light switch off, I'll have to go back and look at it. Look at it. It's not like OCD, but it's, I, I'm, I'm a bit like that. I speak quickly. Everything I do, I write music. Everything I do, I write quickly. So yeah. my wife just is just like, you know, couldn't you just be good at just one other thing? Like, just vaguely good at one other thing. Like, just writing music's not much use to anybody, really. You know what? You can't, you know, fix the, fix the house thing that needs fixing that. I just, I'm hopeless. I have to hire someone to do it, you know? So I guess I have one talent, and this is it. we got time. Maybe you can figure something else out. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I think that's what you were talking about, um, working with the Ubisoft guys, uh, and they're, you know, uh, predominantly french right so i can imagine you sending a mile a minute conversation their way in uh non-native english um but yeah my, my my wife's actually the the same way we always uh we call it flooding uh we also call it the bill burr highway based on the comedian um right. but like i can tell when we're talking, it's like, is this going to be a 10 second thing or is this going to be like a 10 minute thing? Do I need to, do I need to pause the TV show so that she can get it all out there? Um, right. But it's, yeah, it's fun. Pumpkin no, I totally get that. I, th I feel like, you know, like, um, so, you know, my rabbit is a combination between, I feel like Milan, Ubisoft Milan are the main developer for the game, but Paris are obviously involved in it. Like a lot of the stuff okay. in Paris as well. Okay. So Ramar Brio is English is fantastic. He's a real, a real language book. So he's great. Davide Soliani's English is really, really good, but not as good as Ramat. So, um, so sometimes we get a little bit lost in translation, but not. It only, it's only happened a couple of two or three times over the like since 2015, really, when they've said something that I thought sounded a bit wrong, and I've done it. And isn't that what kind of worked the word and means something different to them? Mm -hmm. um, but you know, like, Katrina, I speak no word of any other language at all, and they can communicate with me very, very well. It's like fantastic. You know, it's like I've got yeah. no room to complain. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They're they're the ones saving you. Yeah. Um, so I've got uh, I got two questions that I, I'm just kind of curious about. But you've been mentioning some of the like your highlights of of the past 
uh you know your career but is there any like game studio that you've wanted to work with that you just haven't had the opportunity if they came a knock in you'd be totally into it uh, i don't think i worked for ea at all actually i've not been doing it for ea i've never, never worked for them apart from i guess kingdom of Amalog went out through ea so indirectly um I'd like to do something for Valve. Valve would make great games. I mean, they don't seem to make many games these days, but when they do make them, they're great. Oh. Um, you know, I'd like to work for Nintendo, I guess, as well. I must admit, I guess probably prime, prime my number one would be Nintendo. And I did Smash Brothers, but to do a whole Nintendo game, like, a, you know, I mean, it's not going to happen, but a whole Zelda game would be like, that would be, I mean, I love Zelda. It would be yeah. incredible for me. I'm never going to get anywhere near it because they've got, they've got such a lot of great composers over there. They don't need me. But, um, you know, something like doing a Zelda game would be unbelievable um, uh, to get to touch those tunes. Like, I've, I've got to touch a few of Koji Kondo's tunes over the course of the Mario Rabbids games, you know. Um, but to get to touch that, da, 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 da. I mean, yeah. you know, I'd, I'd just be crying the entire time, you know. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I think to work for Nintendo on a whole project would be amazing. That's that's awesome. I, I guess, uh, I mean, you mentioned a few of them, but there, are there any composers that you would love to work with on a project that you haven't yet? So. Oh. I haven't really done that much, very much in the past. I mean, I did, I guess, do World of Warcraft Shadowlands. The, the, the Blizzard guys always use a lot of composers, you know, so, and they're always brilliant. So, like, Neil Cree and David Arkenstone and Glenn Stafford and, you know, those guys, and Jake Lefkowitz, I mean, they're all great, great composers, you know, and it was good to work with them on that. So I've done, I've done a ton of collaboration, and even when I've collaborated with another composer, it's only been in the same, in, in as we don't actually work in each other's pieces, we just do our own pieces and contribute to the game. The only person I've actually physically exchanged pieces with and worked on other pieces is Danny Baranowski. I mean, Danny are great mates. And at the desktop dungeons, we actually gave each other each other pieces and, and worked on them, you know, and switched them back and forth like that. That's the only yeah. time I've ever that's the only time I've ever done ever done it. Um, so um, so no, so I haven't really done much of that. And I've got to say, I tr I know this is, this might sound bad, but I try not to listen to what other games composers are doing if I can help it. I don't want to listen. To, I don't want to be influenced by it. I want to yeah. try and put up. People often say I sound like me. I don't know if I do, but if, if that, that might be the reason that I sound like me, because I, I try not to pull too much from anybody else. Apart sure. from like, I've I listened to John Williams day in, day out, and so I, I try to copy him as best I can, but he's, he's brilliant and I'm not that good. So, you know, I try my best, you know. Um, so I would I would definitely say I'd, I'd rip off lots of John Williams. Like, uh, any chance I get to do it, <laughs> I'll do it. Um, but games composers wise, I, mean, I, do, I sort of listen, I, do, I know what people are up to. Like I know I know my friends that I know. Like I know Austin Wintry and Sarah Shatner, Gareth Coker. You know I know I, I, Danny and Jimmy Hinton. I know, and the guys I know as friends, I do sort of know what they're up to. Um, you know, there's, there's plenty more on top of that lot. But I don't really actively search out what they're doing unless I really unless I bump into it. Unless a link pops up somewhere, I guess I have quick listen. You know. Um, I was on a, a, a judge and jury panel a couple of years ago for an award ceremony. I listened to quite a lot of game stuff then, um, but I don't traditionally do it very much, just because I want to try and keep it out of my head if I can. Or stolen from John Williams. <laughs> <laughs> or stolen from John Williams. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's or, Danny, or Danny Elfman. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I can't forget Danny Elfman. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it seems like the uh, like the sound composer, sound design in games crew is a pretty like tight-knit crew uh and it's it's i say this all the time but for gdex the music composition and sound design uh is like one of the biggest things like people want more workshops and more speakers and whatever from that you would think it would be i don't know like programming or whatever but it music composition and sound design is always if it's not number one it's number two requested for gdex every year um so there's a lot of people that are interested in getting in that space. Uh, and now you've got other things like voice acting and stuff is starting to really um, find its way. Uh, I have a, uh, a question here about using um, like copyright free music uh, as opposed to, um, you know, using other copyrighted music specifically for games. Do you have any thoughts on that? Is that something that you're seeing where uh, I know there's several big websites that give you like royalty free music to use in games. Yeah, well, I guess that's the way to do it. But I guess lots of the time, it might not completely match what you want. You get, you pay someone to write it, you get it's exactly what you want in the right place at the right time and the right stuff. I mean, there's plenty of library tracks out there you can you can you can pull from. I'm sure there are. Um, just whether 
if it's right for your game and that's the, that's the budget you've got or whatever it is, I mean, I guess it's any way it makes you right. And uh, going up to that point you made before about the, the GDEX audio sort of track thing, I feel like writing music these days has so changed, it's so easy to do it now because the computers are so powerful. There's so much software out there that you can get and make something with hardly any ability at all. Um, is it's a great it's a great thing though it's a great thing that gets people composing music like I mean you know I use this thing called the uh, Spitfire Audio in the UK you make a lot of great you know audio libraries for for composers they've, they've got one called the BBC Symphonic so I use that one but they've got a, like a free like a really cut down version which is like fifty bucks or something like that and you see so you get the you get the entire BBC Symphonic so they've played together for hundred years or something ridiculous you know you can get there on your computer and fiddle when you, have, you know you can sit and fiddle with an orchestra a real live orchestra on your computer and get to play with instruments see what it sounds like i mean going back 15 20 years there's no chance of doing that yeah you know, the fact that you can anybody can just get hold of that software and have a go with it and go oh, i can write music you know I, I don't i'm a great believer in i don't think you need to have any musical education whatsoever i'm sure lots of parents don't want to hear that or any or, or universities but i kind of feel like you just need to get stuck in and do it you know, I didn't, when I, you know, when I first wrote, wrote music for games, I had no idea I could do it. You know, I was when I was at I told you before when I was at music college doing music uh, for four years. And like, I failed the harmony exam three years out of four because I was terrible at harmony. Like I just didn't understand it whatsoever. Like I failed it, like out, absolute desperate fail, and only scraped by in the last year. You know. Yeah. I just feel if you can hear it, you can write it. Guess get buy something and mess around with it. You know. I mean, like, I mean, Hans Zimmer says you can make a movie score with a laptop and a mic and a, a set of headphones, and he's right. Yeah, yeah, that's that's awesome. I I play guitar a little bit, and I just actually started. Um, I started taking piano lessons the week before COVID hit and everything shut down. Right. So I got a, I got a bunch of free lessons that I I still got to go cash in. But I've been wanting to learn um, piano and stuff because I've, I mean, I have software. My Mac comes with software that allows yeah. me to do some basic it actually has lessons on it too um and i've got you know a keyboard so i just kind of wanted to learn and understand music a little better pumpkin i'm gonna need to navigate you here uh is this uh is it this bbc spitfire audio is that the yeah so spitfire, spitfire audio is the is the uh the web the, web, the website they've got tons and tons of, of plugins on there like all sorts of stuff so i've got a couple of their libraries but i did i bought a couple of years ago it's called the bbc so the bbc Symphony orchestra so they, there's a very famous studio in the UK called Maida Vale. I think the orchestra have been in there for years and years and years. So they thought a lot of times simple sample libraries will hire um, session players to come in and, and, and they'll record them. But they, they, but they thought if they hired an entire, if they did the entire orchestra of players that play together every day, day in, day out, it might have a bit of cohesiveness, cohesiveness to it. So that's why it's the way it is. I, like, I, like, I think the library is great. You know, I bet any library you buy is not going to be perfect. They never are. There's something always bits that are not quite right. But I like that library. And I've got the other orchestra library of theirs, which is just called the, I forget, it's three bits, brass wind percussion. I've got that, but not brass wind and strings. Um, so, um, but like, you know, like you say, you get a, get, you get a, like a, a computer and, you, and you, it's got logic on it or something else, or Gary Band or something like that, you know, and you can mess around with it. Um, yeah. I, think it's, I think it's fantastic. And like, you know, I, think, I feel that's opened the door to tons of people who wouldn't be able to do it, to be able to do it. And didn't know they had the talent to do it until they fiddled with it. Well, no, I can do this. And also, just about your piano lessons, I am the worst piano player in the world. I couldn't play you a single piece of my music with both hands on a piano. I couldn't do it. That BBC Sync Ox, I'm using that all the time. So that's one I can't live without right now. Um, I've got Omnisphere as a synth. Um, uh, I use that a lot. I've got the Roland Cloud stuff to so get all the, leg all the old legendary synths back, the Juno 106, Juno 60, and whatever, Jupiter 8 stuff. But, you know, what I will say is, I don't really think it's about that. I think it's about you finding something that you like. Like a lot of the times, like you buy Cubase or one of these sequencing programs, you'd be able to get it at a student rate right? if you're a student. And they come with synths, all that stuff built in. Like, it's not like you just get a blank sequencing program that you can't do anything with it. There'll be synthesizers inside it. There'll be some kind of orchestral stuff inside it. You buy, you buy uh, contact, the sample, the sample that, that Native Instruments make, and you get contact library with it, which has got orchestral and, you know, rock band stuff and 
world instruments and all sorts of stuff just built in that you can play with it, you know. Um, so I really feel like, you know, people say, what's the best door at Digital Audio Workstation? There's a lot of them out there. It's the one that you like the best because they all do pretty much the same thing with a few little idiosyncrasies that are slightly different. But, So I use Pro Tools exclusively. I don't, I'm not, I've, I've got the Falcon. I've done. I've used it. That, that's, a, that's a big synth, right? Isn't it? Is that a big synth? Yeah, right. So I've got to say I never touched it, but it's mainly because I'm mainly asked to write orchestral music these days, most of the time. Like I did with Max of Dungeons, which was all that's not Max of Minecraft Dungeons was all was all synthy stuff. So that you know, and I still get asked to do stuff with bits and pieces like that, but. I get an awful lot of orchestral requests because I'm not I'm just known for that sort of thing. So I don't do a ton of synthy stuff. Um, I've never touched Falcon. So I get my go to when I get Pro Tools, that would be I'll go to Omnisphere because it's massive. And the Roland, the Roland Cloud libraries are great because it's got that old, that really authentic analog sound that people are looking for. And it's great for them to play around with it. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else that I really go to that, that sort of stuff, synthy wise. I think those are my two main ones because so obviously it's got a lot of cinematic stuff to it and a lot of great big things, you know, kind of thing. Uh, and the Rodent's just got that kind of total retro, you know, realistic sounding analog stuff that I, I, that I like to hear. So, but it's not like I wouldn't use it. I just haven't got around to looking at it. I mean, I've, you know, like a lot of time when you're thinking you're a working composer, you don't have time to, to try stuff out. I guess that's one of the drawbacks of if you're busy that you don't have time to look at new stuff and you have to wait until you've got a bit of downtime to find that thing you would be wanting to look at for the last year or two years even, and you get time to look at it. And like sometimes you often buy, like the, that Damage um, cushion library, which is fantastic. It's been around for years, but it's still being used a lot. Um, like I only recently, I've, I've, I've really looked at how that really works, you know, because I've had to. Um, you know, you kind of get a preset going and it's quick and you can get it in there and you just, you know, you get time to mess around with it, you know. So, um, like, you know, I look, I guess I no, there's just a, a lot of composers, certainly in LA, I've got lots of teams of people who help them out in the writing, right? I have just me, I have nobody else. So it's just me. Anything you hear that has got my name on it is just me, most well, all the time. Um, so I don't have anybody else that works for me. I just do it all. So um, I don't often have the time to sort of find new things unless I've, unless I've really got to look for something. Unless someone, someone asks for something that I've already got or understand, I go looking for it. So when I was at Rare, and before prior to, prior to going to Rare, I used Cubase exclusively, and I really liked it. And then halfway through Rare, Robin Beanland, who's uh, the head of music there, a great friend of mine, um, he we used to record into Pro Tools on the on the old G5 Mac, I think it was, the Republic, the round one. Uh, and so we'd so we'd write it on Cubase in Cubase, uh, and I'd write you could write it, your samples and all that to make something, then we'd record it to Pro Tools, then we'd mix it in there, and then you know, and then it go. Um, but then it, but um, he, but then media wasn't great on Pro Tools. It was pretty crappy. Uh, it wasn't really built. It wasn't really built for that. But not until was it Pro Tools nine, when it basically became just like Cubase. So Robin started using it, and it, and it was nice to have everything in just one door, right? Everything you had was sat inside. There was nothing. There was no. We didn't have to have um, the Vienna library on ensemble library sitting outside of it, holding lots of samples because you know like that, that that. And also Pro Tools, sorry, had a bit of a back, a bit of a. It was only 32 bit for a long time and everything else gone 64 bits. So you're limited to that four gigabytes of memory that, that XP would, would let you have. Um, in, but, but when it went 64 bit, which is, I forget, that was just like, just completely up and over. So because I, I was using Pro Tools, I kind of got um, stuck with it, I think. And I, you, you, when you've been using such a, long, such a long time, to try to learn something new is a real pain in the ass, right? So I've just, I've just stuck with Pro Tools since then. And the MIDI is as good as anything else, as far as I'm concerned. Um, uh, and so, but it wasn't great at the start. So I can see why people often think Pro Tools isn't up to a MIDI. And it, I can tell you it definitely is. Just I'm on Pro Tools, I think it's 2021, 20, whatever it is. The, the, the late, I've had that subscription, so it's on the latest like, like version. But in the MIDI on it's great. MIDI on it's great. So it's just like any other door. It's no different. But and, all, and the great thing about that is that when I do have to go to a studio with an orchestra, Pro Tools is in, is in practically every studio that you, you ever go to. 
you know, occasionally you'll find new endo, but it's mostly Pro Tools is still the industry standard. So, you know, you can you can get your sessions straight over there, straight in, and there's no messing around, you know, which is good. Thank you, Lucas. Uh, so we're getting a little close to the end here, but I, uh, I'm, I'm kind of curious. I've been doing I, I, a music club uh, on Facebook where I have this group and I post a new album. And one of the albums that we did last year was John Carpenter's album where he's created his own, you know, synth music and pulled in some from his movies or whatever. But like, do you have any desire to make an album of your own or any kind of work like that? Or are you just are you floating along on your current well, I did that, that Magic Zoo Rejig before Christmas, right, last year. So that was my remix of all the, you know, I've been I'm trying to do it for, for, for ages. It took me years to get around to it. Um, so I thought, everybody's remixed Magic Zoo so many times. I kind of thought I should just do it myself. I could do one myself. So, you know, it's on, it's everywhere. Spotify, iTunes, it's on everywhere. So it's called Magic Zoo Rejig by me. So I picked like 10 tracks uh, from, the, from the first game and just did them in lots of different styles. Like uh, PCT Peaks and like a scar sort of um top um top sort of thing like that. I did Gruntilda's Lane, big orchestral. I did like a big, big metal version of Gobi's Valley, and then a synthy version of uh, Mumbo's Mountain, uh, a Game Boy version of Treasure Trove Cove, you know. And so I stuck it out and it did pretty well. People seemed to like it, you know. So, um, and it was my first time I've ever done that. So I am, even though it was like, I've got to say, I, I found it super hard to redo my own stuff. I was like pulling teeth. I hated it. Everybody really? did it. Yeah. Why? I just, I don't know. I, I'm not really good at going back to my own stuff and trying to polish it and make it better. I'm just not good like that. Um, and so, but when I liked it. When I finished it, I thought, oh, I like it. it. Sounds great. But doing it was absolute pulling teeth. I just, I just didn't like doing it. And I can thought, you, you never did. Go on. Can you do, can you do that for like other people's work? Sort of look at it critically and make suggestions and thoughts? Yeah, I'm all right at that. Just not my own. I can't do yeah, it. Your own. I can, yeah, I just, I just found it like, Turgid doing it. Um, that's not that's the word, is it? But, um, but, um, so, but, um, but when I faced it, I really liked it. And I said, I'm never doing this again, ever. But I'm already thinking I'm going to have another go. So, because um, everyone seemed to like it a lot. It did, it did pretty well, and people seemed to like, like, the, like the stuff. And it's the only way I can get my own music out there, because, like, I wish Rare would put out all the old N64 soundtracks on Spotify. And I, I, don't, know, I don't know, I've asked them a hundred times to do it, and they just don't seem that they want to do it. Totally. Um, yeah, and I just kind of feel it would be great if they got all those all those soundtracks just up on the on the street. It doesn't to put them on Spotify. No, it doesn't cost anything. It just costs you just got to put it up there and forget about it. Simply, it's all the the only thing about that is uploading the tracks. That's the slowest part. Like yeah. everything else, it's super quick, right? Anyway, so I, I hope they'll do it one day. So I kind of thought I want to get my stuff out there the best I can. So I'm thinking now I might do rather than pick one game like. That I did in the past. I might do tunes from different from. I might do a bit from DK and a bit from Tui and a bit from Perfect Dark and a, a tune from so you know and try and put together like just I, I don't I don't call it greatest hits but my favourite bits are my own from all the games that I've done and just try and do new versions. And I also thought like putting it together as a full album took me forever, right? So I think sure. what I might do is to make it easier for me is to do it just do singles, one offs. So I might. I can thinking now I might I might have a go at uh, DK at Crystal Case. I really like Crystal Case, so I might just do that and put that one out, and then do another one a few months later. So I, so it just they just put them out singles as opposed to a big album, which means it takes me like I, God knows how long to do it. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So I might just do some few little single bits that I like um, from stuff that I've done. I mean, you know, I, it, it, I, it was hard. It really was hard. So I'll see how I go. I'm not promising, but that's my that's what I'm thinking I might do. I, I think a lot of people would be into that. And I just, you mentioned Spotify. So I, you got a lot of songs on Spotify right now. Well, uh, you know, yeah, I, I, I do it myself. I keep, I get most of it up to myself. Like the, the Mary Rabbids thing was put on there by Ubisoft and the World of Warcraft by Blizzard. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I call a lot of those stuff, like the Band Kazooie albums on there. The two tracks I did for, did for Quackity on his, uh, in his Minecraft stream for Last Nevados. They seem very popular. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so, you know, um, I, you know, I feel like you need to be on the streamers. You need to be up there with everybody else, right? Sure. And I think I've got quite a modest following compared to some of the composers. That they've got millions of followers, way more than I have. Um, so I just like, I just feel like it's a for posterity. Get up there, you know. I'll do yeah. a bit of 2E, do a bit of DK, do a bit of whatever. Uh, but I might, as I say, I might just do it in singles. 
and not in an not in an album form. So I'm just it'll take me forever to do. Well, I just uh, I just followed you. So well, thank you very um, much. Uh, how does when you are doing like those remixes and stuff? How does like the IP and stuff work? Like who? Because a lot of the songs are owned by the companies or whatever, right? Do they let you remix them, or is it something you got to go through a legal process, or do you? Is it mixed enough that it's a new considered a new creation? No, oh, it has. It's, it has to be classed as a cover version. So I, I'm, I'm I'm essentially covering my own songs. That's how okay. I have to do it. But it's quite a few, you know, companies out there these days that take care of all that for you. So I went through Sounddrop, and Sounddrop they take care of all the licensing issues. So they use give the tracks. They make sure the track is uh, initially for to, to be classed as a cover version. The music has to exist on an album somewhere, a, a release CD, if you like, somewhere. So there's certain tracks from Banjo that I couldn't do because they were never released. So I did have another, I had, an, I had an extra track that I'd done for that Banjo Kazooie rejigged. It was a compilation of all the, I called it INPCU because it was like a little, all, all the NPC tunes stuck together, like, you know, Mr. Vile and Grunt, uh, Grunt, uh, the, the Good Witch, I forgot what she's called now, Brentil, they know what, you know, and all, you know, stuff. And, and, but I, I, told I couldn't use that because none of those tracks had been released. Okay. Individually, and a compilation has to be. You have to list each track individually in the title. See, so the title will be like this long. So, and they take care. Of, I think it's ten cents a track they pay royalty wise to the the people that own it. So they track down the owners. So they so they'll pay Microsoft and Rare the, the royalty things. It's completely legal. So okay. I, I, I've used DistroKid for stuff that I put out that I own, um, and they and, and that all goes to me. But I don't think they're really that well set up to do proper cover version stuff. I think Sound Drop. Are totally set up to do it. That's what they primarily exist to do. So they can take it as long as they, as long as they can, I can find the track to be released somewhere. You're good to go. So that's people can record my can do cover my stuff, put it through SoundDrop, SoundDrop in the ten ten cents to rail, whoever owns it, Microsoft, what have you, and then they'll take a cut off whatever comes in. You get the rest of it. That's how it works. And what, I forget what I forget what the splits are, but that's the only way. Because at first I did I did say to rail, I want to do a covers album. Is that all right? And they weren't keen at the, the very keen when I asked them. It was kind of a few years ago now, um, <clears throat> and so it never happens. And so, but the, now these all these kind of companies exist. There's, quite, there's lots, a lot of matter that do this, not just Soundrop. There's other people um, that do it, so it, you know you're completely legally covered. Um, and also, like a lot of the tracks that I did in the past, Microsoft and Rare haven't, cla haven't claimed them. Like there's a big that whole new digital music thing. What's it called? The the, the actor went through Congress. To try to fix the copyright holes, right? Like, and you know, all the like ASCAP and BMI try to fix that whole copyright thing where people are stealing music left, right, and center and not paying the composers. Um, so the, that's gradually getting fixed. But to so set up a new digital <clears throat> online thing where you can claim your music, but you've only got two years to do it. And if you don't claim it in two years, <clears throat> it, you lose the right to it. So a lot of these big games companies who traditionally don't really care about music very much. They'll bung out a free CD because someone sounds like they feel like it, I'll put it online because they don't really, they don't really care. They don't, they don't consider it to be a money spinner. They may end up losing the rights to their tracks. Um, okay. uh, wow. and, 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 so it's like it's a, it's a big mechanical copyright thing that's going on right now. I just can't remember the name of the, the, name of the bloody the body. It's Digital Music Music Act, DMA, something like that. So, you know, it's all that thing about how Spotify pay people 0. 0.0003 cents per stream. You know, because they consider it, they consider it a performance, and not a downloading of the music. The stream it doesn't count like a like buying a CD, like playing a CD track. So that's the way that, that's the loophole they've got round it by saying we don't need to pay a proper rate per track because it's not. It's just a performance. It's not an actual. You don't own the track. You don't actually download it. And, you know, that's, yeah, the way yeah. they, that's the way they got round it. So you know, that's when you see people like Pharrell who did that. I'm happy song had 65 million streams and made $12,000 out of it. Like, you know, it's, it's at the moment it's daylight robbery, but it's yeah. partly because of the record labels who own the songs made their deal with Spotify and all the rest of them, you know, and made, and got, got a good deal for them and just said, the artist's tough luck, it's up to you. The artist got shafted, right? And that's yeah. why people like Taylor, Taylor Swift have pulled the music and, from all the streamers because she makes a lot, they've got the money without it, right? And she's going, I'm not having you raping my music catalog and pay me 0 0.003 cents a play yeah i i i was uh watching a thing about taylor swift a couple weeks right. ago where she went and recorded all of her songs remastered yeah. them like 
and because she and I mean that was you know that's that's happened before with like the Beatles was like Creedence Clearwater Revival and John Fogarty had that big thing. Mm. It's Ozzy, just like yeah, yeah, that's totally right. Ozzy Osbourne did it as well. Ozzy Osbourne went back and record, we recorded all the early stuff for different people. Yeah, it's yeah. It's, it's like it's sort of like the same old shit. It's just new technology. Yeah, it's, it, I think the whole streaming thing and has happened so fast. You know, the whole digitization of all of it. Like, it's too easy to share music round for free. And people don't want to pay for music anymore. It's like, oh, why, do I, why should I pay for it? But they forget that if you don't pay artists for the music, you're not going to be an artist to record it in, in the first place. Sure. Not gonna, they, they, you can't do this a job. Like, it's got back to playing live is the only way you can make money. That's only if you're big. If you're a small band, you get shafted in playing live. You get you lose money off hand of a fist. So yeah. that whole digital copyright thing, I mean, they, try, they are trying to fix it, and it's in, certainly in the, in the throes of it right now. You can search it up. You'll find how far they've got. I think it's, it's called a DMCA. Something like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Or, or DMC. No, it's not DMC. It's something. It's something. I've got the. I'm a member of the thing. But anyway, so the you know all the the PRO, the uh, performing rights organisations around the world are trying to slowly fix it. Like PRS in the UK, ASCAP and BMI and the CSAC over here. They're all trying to, and it's been before Congress, and a lot of it's got passed. Um, but it's to try and stop that musical raping that those streamers do. Even people like Netflix don't pay that great on the residual end like oh, yeah. The big, yeah. yeah like the big the big you know like the big money in it for a composer is a, is a tv guys so they get paid the most so if you're a tv guy you know in years gone by and you got a hit show and played around the world the residuals were gigantic yeah. like you know millions That's of dollars you know along those lines i'm really curious about um like games pass for from microsoft's game pass how how that's eventually going to work for paying the end developers and producers like right now microsoft's eating the cost on that but that can't go on forever like no at some point microsoft's gonna have to adjust price points and stuff um but yeah you see we have streaming movie music we have streaming movies and tv and now we're moving towards this streaming game thing uh and it's just it's definitely disrupting the the market um i, I, I expect it's the, the way, we, the, way that, the way they would like to do it with music is this, that it's a, the game's model is, is usually that you get paid a lump sum and that, that's it. So there's mm-hmm. no, you don't get any residuals, no royalties later on, it's, it's all gone. So I usually get half at the front, half at the end. Or if it's a long project, half at the front, a bit in the middle, a bit at the end, that's how I get paid. So you get lump sums, but then they completely own it, you know. And I think that um, with movies, you'd get a, you'd get a lot of money at the, at the start and all that, but you also get residuals from around, whenever it gets shown in movie theatres, shown on the TV, it generates a lot of cash. Most people make the same again from the residuals mm-hmm. that, they got in the, that they got in the first place, right? So, but the new streaming thing is, is right, I want to adopt the games model and they'll give you a lump sum at the start, if you're not going to get any residuals or a very tiny residuals. So that's when the TV, TV guys are kind of going, wait a minute, that's not how I make money. Like the TV guys get paid. If you're the guy that writes a theme tune to who wants to be a millionaire, right, or something like yeah. that, that gets played in every country in the world for donkey's years, you just retire, right? That's it. You make you yep. make millions of dollars, like literally millions of dollars. Like it's a lot of money. So well, it like the uh, uh, the Friends cast still makes like twenty yeah. million a year. Yeah, absolutely. On residuals for yeah. So I think that, that, that I think that everyone's trying to go. Let's adopt the games model where we pay you you know a decent amount of money at the start, but you're out of it after that. You get nothing after that. Um, and so the TV guys don't like it, but us games guys have been used to it for years, right? We don't own the copyright. They own the, all the stuff. That all the AAA companies own it all. Um, you know. Where are you but, on the uh, the NFT conversation? I just think it's nonsense. I've got to say, I think it's a one huge great scam. That's what I feel. Okay. Um, I just feel I just feel like owning a bit of. I think I was having a conversation with Davide yesterday, and he sort of, he was sort of saying, you know, like if he wants to buy a picture by a photographer, he wants to buy the actual print that the photographer approved by the right lighting. If you get it on, if you buy it as an NFT, whatever, whatever monitor you've got might show it differently. It'll show, it'll show different than every monitor around the world. What if it's exactly the same? You get the actual print on the actual thing the artist painted. It's exactly what they want it to look like in, with your eyes, right? Um, on, a, on a monitor screen, it's going to be different wherever you look at it, resolution-wise, color-wise, all that stuff, right? So, and I kind of agree with that. I think you want to get, the, you want to get it from the horse's mouth, right? You don't want it to pass it down through something digital. And I just feel like it's a massive scam to diddle people out of the work, the, the original work. They steal it, they sell it. I've already seen it with music. Even my stuff's been already stuff. I've seen people selling it that they've known it. Oh, you know? really? Yeah. yeah. A couple of weeks ago on Twitter, I was, there was somebody that was, was selling all my stuff. I mean, how on earth they got all of it? I don't know. You know, yeah. it's, it's a bit like, how can you do that without my permission? 
stuff that I own. My uh, my good friend does a t-shirt design. He started doing it in the mid two thousands when there weren't all these print on demand t-shirts. Uh, and there's several times where like somebody would text him and be like, "Oh, hey, you know, Beyonce is wearing your shirt or whatever." And he would look at it and he's like, "No, that's not mine. Somebody stole it, yeah. tweaked it just a little bit, and then resold it." And uh, I, I just think like it's it's that kind of diddling creators out of money. It seems to be getting more prevalent as time goes on. You know, and you're just going to lose that ability for people to do it and make a living, make a living anymore. Like your favorite artists are going to go, I just can't afford to make music anymore. I yeah. have to go look at Target or Walmart or something to make to make to 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 keep my earnings. You know, you know what I mean. I think that, and it, it's I don't know I, that whole thing. I just don't think it's right. I think that you need to pay people fairly for what they do, whatever it is. You know, sure. people need to get a fair cut of the of the money. If, this, if you're selling your music's getting sold somewhere, you need to get a fair crack of the whip. Unless you've sold a contract, you've signed a contract like I do that says I don't own any of it. And then yeah. that's fair enough. I'm, I've done that deal. It's been done, right? We're all, we're all okay it. I think like in Europe, I think in Europe, I think in France, actually, I think there's something where the composers can never be, always own the music they write. They can never be taken away. Um, there's a thing in America where the composer always retains the right to share. Um, so that means if, if it's performed live somewhere, you would get paid for that and they can't take that off you. It's only 50%. 50% goes to the publisher, 50% goes to you, but they can't take that share. That's, it's, I think it's a law here. They can't take that off you. Okay. Um, that's kind of the performance side of it, but the mechanical side, the physical quantity that's been sold, they'll keep that. They will keep that. Um, but the right to share always goes to the composer. But that's only like performances. So, you know, I guess it's on the TV, on the radio. Um, well, not, actually, not on the radio, because in America, America is, funny enough, America doesn't collect royalties from the radio. That's why you've got so many radio stations, because it d- doesn't cost them anything to play the music. Which is yeah. crazy. Like, yeah, yeah, like in the UK, if you get your record played on the radio, it's like 10 quid or 20 pounds, or whatever, kind of, for every place. You get a hit single in the UK, if it's played on every radio station in the UK, you've got to pay you. You get paid every time it gets played. In America, they don't collect any domestic royalties for radio or movies. So anybody who's got a movie score and played in the US, you don't get any money from that. Consider promotion or something, and I don't know. It's crazy. Americans never never sorted it out. So any music you hear in the radio, that's why you got like in the UK, there's, you know, there's a lot less radio stations because it costs them money to play music. In America, there's a gazillion radio stations because it doesn't cost them anything, and they get advertising money. Great for them. They can play what they like. Sure. Huh. Well, we're getting close to the end here. I, I do want to mention one comment which is a, a viva pinata remix album seems to be highly desired you know what I, lo- I love i loved writing viva pinata it's the first time i got to use live orchestra and i still cry listening to that music it's, it's really touches my heart that music i tried so hard to write something classical classical ish i guess you would call it yeah for that, for that thing but because it's live orchestra i don't know how i would translate it to something else like it's already been done as live orchestra i need to make it synthesizer i don't know what or something else I don't know how what that would sound like because I really like the way it sounds so much right now. Sure. Um, so I don't know, but I'm very I'm very glad that whoever wrote that liked it, and I'm very flattered. Yeah, I I think Viva Pinata's got a it's got a soft spot in a lot of people's hearts, um, and I think it was kind of I mean I hesitate to say like the swan song because it's not like rare when anywhere, but it kind of capped off like a really strong period of time where rare was just making great stuff, and um, a lot of people grew up with it, you know. I know. I feel like I feel like Rare getting bought by Microsoft. It I, it did go a bit sour for a little while, no doubt about yeah. it. But I feel like it just took Rare and Microsoft a long time to understand each other. That's what I feel like. And a lot of a lot of the older people that were the guys that I knew have left. There's not very many people from those days left at Rare these days. There's a few, but not many. Yeah. Um, everything's changed. The management entirely. It's just it's all new. So you know, and Connect Sports did the first two did pretty well. Third one not so much. But you know, Sea of Thieves seems to be doing great. So. Yeah. Maybe it's just taken Rare all this time to kind of get the whole Microsoft, you know, intertwined thing. I think it seems to have been great now, so it's worked oh, yeah. out in the end. I feel like a, a lot of it has to do with just Microsoft having to learn. I think Phil Spencer had a lot of great changes at Microsoft to, like, change just how Xbox interacts with its developers, you know, its, its studios. Um, and obviously, they've been buying a ton of them, so we'll see what the next I know. I know, few right? years are going to look like. Um I feel, I, I, I feel like yeah, sorry. I feel like it's going to be you're going to get two or three companies that just own all the all the AAA studios eventually. Be two or three people companies that own the whole lot. Just like oh, Reckon, yeah. just like Reckon Street now, like there's a few companies that own everybody. It'll be like that. 
Oh, absolutely. I, 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 I think I mentioned this in a previous uh, show, but I would not be surprised like if Sony went and bought Konami and, you know, a few others, and it just becomes this thing where it's, it's literally owned by, oops, sorry, I'm it's owned by Sony, Microsoft, or Nintendo. Yeah. Like it's, it's like the movie industry, right? There's a few massive companies that like Viacom own everybody, you know, it's like something like whatever it is, yeah. or, you know, or Comcast or somebody, they just own a decillion things, and I guess that's the way it's going to be. I guess so. Well, Grant, uh, I want to thank you again for being on the show. Is there anything uh, that you want to let folks know about anywhere that they can reach you or anything you want to, um, you're excited to talk about before we close up here? I don't know, really. I guess my, my average sparks, I hope, at some point. Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, well, my best, I think the best place to get me is Twitter. Like I do monitor that most of the time. Um, so if they want to ask me a question or something, I'll probably find it on, get it on Twitter. Um, that's where I've got the most people that follow me. So, um, I'd, I'd, you know, I do try to reply to everybody if I possibly can. Um, if I don't, it's only because I'm busy. Um, so, and I like messing around on Twitter. I just, I just think it's fun. You know, when yeah. I, I usually what I do, yeah, when I'm writing a piece of music, I'll get to a certain point and go, I need a five minute break. I'll just mess around on the Twitter for five minutes. You know, I, I, that's how I'm on it most of the time. So, um, yeah, that's where to get me. I'm on there. Yeah, and, th and that's just at Grant Kirkhope. Yes. Yes, of course. I've got, I've got my life. It's slightly important. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, Grant, thank you so much for uh, being on the show. I had a blast. I think the uh, audience had a good time. Uh, so we're going to go close out uh, on behalf of myself, Chris, baby who's taking a nap, Lucas, and uh, Grant, thank you all for coming. We will see you next Friday at 1 o'clock. Bye.